Good evening and welcome to Round Table. Today we have with us Professor Rajiv Vijay Singha. He is the Secretary of the Ministry of Hu Disaster Management and Human Rights and also former Secretary General of the Peace Secretariat. He has also been the President of the Liberal Party and also before the Senior Professor in Languages in the Sabargam University. So a distingui he is distinguished for his political analysis and creative and critical work. So Professor, good evening. Good evening. So that's such a lot of interesting gamut of experiences and a lot of portfolios that you've been holding. So would you please give some more details about your background? And it also looks as if there's a, like an interesting switch from the academia to the public service. Also, we would like to, you to touch upon your family background because we all know that your father is the very respected and very well-known former Secretary General of the Parliament. So, Professor... To you. Well, I have to say that at the age of 55, I was hoping I could escape from my father's shadow. It's a very good shadow to be under, I have to say. Uh, but uh, it was also a good experience growing up with him, and I was very interested in politics from the start. As you know from my being president of the Liberal Party, but the Liberal Party, I think, is not so much a political party as a think tank. That's what we presented ourselves as. We did a lot of work on things like constitutional reform, and I have to say that I think our works, Rajitana Kamratungas, are perhaps more clear on the need for constitutional reform and as particular the anomalies in the Java Ordinary Constitution that need to be rectified, that everyone agrees need to be rectified. But I myself, you know, I did stand for president in 1999. It was a good experience, but I think one should only do these things once. Uh, but uh, I was in academia. I enjoyed it. I did a lot of extracurricular work while in academia. You know, I helped to start English medium in uh, the year 2000, which I think was a great step forward. But I also did a lot of work in English in rural communities, so that, you know, when I visit the east or the north, it's going back to places that I spent much time in uh, during the late 80s, right through the decade of the 90s and more recently. But I have to say I was surprised when, uh, in May 2007, I really got a call out of the blue asking me whether I would take up the post of Secretary General of the Peace Secretariat. I thought it was an interesting challenge. I certainly enjoyed the work enormously. I think we contributed to some aspects of the peace process. Um, I'm now what I would call a bureaucrat in the Ministry of Disaster Management and Human Rights. It's not so interesting because, you know, having to sign vouchers for every 15 rupees that's spent takes up a lot of time. But I think there's a lot to be done in that area. We're lucky to have an excellent disaster management center that does a lot of the work. But I think there's much to be done in human rights in sort of perhaps uh, changing some of the structures we have. And we're trying to work on that now. So, Professor, let's talk about the area of work that you're also directly involved with, and that is also the resettlement of the IDPs. Can you also explain to the viewers how the process of I settlement of IDPs was launched and how the concerns like the humanitarian concerns, human rights concerns, and the security concerns was balanced? And also let us know the progress that has been made so far and the level of attention being paid to the dignity of the displaced. And we would also like if you can touch upon the role of organizations such as Amnesty International and Human Rights, which seems to eternally focus on the negative aspects of the resettlement process. Yeah, I think let me start by saying that as far as the resettlement process is concerned, our ministry plays a very small part. There's a Ministry of Resettlement uh, and Disaster Relief, and there's a Ministry of Nation Building, which do a lot of the work, in particular in the north. You also have a presidential task force. Our role was much more a coordinating role for assistance. And in fact, uh, my minister heads the committee that is actually meant to explain what is happening through regular press conferences and so on. So I think in that sense, we can try to answer your question. Uh, but I think the most important part of the whole resettlement process is the government said at the beginning what it was going to do, and it has done it. You know, there were all sorts of stories saying, you know, we intended to keep them there forever and ever and ever. But the government said we would endeavor to resettle the bulk of them within six months. And that has been done. I mean, from our point of view, we did sort of say that around about August perhaps things seemed slow. But I think we were told very clearly, six months doesn't mean half in three months, obviously. When you're doing a resettlement process, you have to lay the background. The government's principles were very, very clear. 
we first had to make sure that the areas were demined because there was a lot of mining, there was a lot of uncertainty, there was slowness about demining until well, the army put its best foot forward and started working rapidly. Uh, the task force brought down some very expensive equipment and then a lot of the agencies that had been quite slow also chipped in so the demining went very well. Uh, the second aspect was security. You see, we knew that amongst these people who came in, there were perhaps very, very few. But there were some who were potentially capable of terrorist activity. We had to clear that up. And again, that was a slow process, but it was thorough. There are people who said, no, no, the security clearance is enough, keep them longer. But the government decided, after about four months, that they had checked enough. These people deserved to be re released. And then the pace of return was rapid. And I think that was, in a sense, well timed, because when we visited in, say, April, May, June, July, the people were relatively happy. You know, they had been released from this terrible bondage of the LTT. By August or September, you could see that they were restless. But uh, once the return started, and they could see that we were keeping our promise to release them as quickly as possible, that positive feeling has come back. So when I last visited the camps, which was last week, you could see that same thing. Of course, what is also interesting is that the people are living an active life. You know, they've got boutiques and things going on. These are signs that they're getting out of the culture of dependence, which I'm afraid, in some instances, they were kept under by this culture of aid and dependence, which had dogged them for 20-odd years, you know, chased from one temporary place to another. I think the government was right to say that we really should try to get them back home as quickly as possible. And I found that that process is going well. So I think we can feel very proud. It's one of the quickest resettlement programs in the whole world in terms of comparative, uh, you know, uh, assessments with other countries that have also suffered this type of uh, delay. And also, Professor, you just referred to your visit uh, like last week. So uh, can you elaborate on the experience like you were saying about the setting up the, of the boutiques and all that? And also, I think you addressed the BizPact forum. And last year, in 2000, uh, before that, 2008, you also went to open the Future Minds uh, exhibition. So when, from that time to now, what sort of uh, differences do you notice? Well, I think there are two parts to that question. One is Jaffna itself, and perhaps I'll deal with that first. Yes, I did go in 2008. I must say I was extremely impressed because the then SF commander in Jaffna, General Chandasiri, who had a very tough time in actually settling it at a time of heightened LTT involvement. You know, uh, in 2006 they tried to break through at Muhammale. And had they broken through them, we would have a terrible time. And there was a lot of underground activity. But over 2006, 2007, you know, he managed to settle things. And by 2008, the citizens of Jaffna were really breathing a sigh of relief. But when he started the Future Minds exhibition, they mentioned it was some time before, the Peace Secretariat, I think, assisted a lot. Uh, I mean, not me, I had my staff, my economic affairs, my uh, security division, they all did a lot of work. And it was a fantastic success. You know, when we went up there, the numbers of young people who were there who were fully involved, it was an extremely pleasant moment. You know, for me, who hadn't been there for a long time in Jaffna, my previous visit had been in 1981 when I went to do some visiting lectures. And I still remember how up upset I was because my students, who were very polite, decent people, they insisted after the lectures that I go and look at the Jaffna Public Library which had been burnt, as you know, in one of the most appalling incidents of, you know, that particular government was very, I, I would say, used violence, not the government itself, but members of that government. And the students were so upset. And when I went back and saw the newly built public library, when I saw the young people coming for the Future Minds exhibition, taking part in, you know, that talent show, etc., you could see that things were moving forward. But at the same time, we travelled in armoured cars. I wasn't allowed to go out far. Uh, it was lovely to have people like the Bishop of Jackson being my fellow opener of this and so on, Mr. Douglas Devananda. But it was a nice combination, you know, the Bishop and the Minister and so on. And you could see that the people appreciated this. It was a partnership. 